Let's say I have a really important board meeting, uh, but it's also my mom's birthday tomorrow. You can take her to the boardroom and celebrate along with that. <laughs> Many people are being asked to leave their workplace. It, it really hurts to see that… I'm glad about that, that it hurts you. Your humanity is alive, please keep it that way. How do we overcome fear of suffering? Your experience of life is determined by either your responding to life or you're compulsively reacting to life. You must be able to profoundly impact lots of people, then everybody feels like family to you. If you unfold your genius, anything that is necessary today, you can do it joyfully. Namaskar, Namaskar Malashya. I said Namaskar. <laughs> I thought they're not on talking terms with me. Well, I think we all love you and we really look up to you. So should we, can I start with my first question? I think all of us here are relatively ambitious people. I'm surely quite ambitious. And uh, in the midst of all of that, I tend to forget about my own needs. So what would your advice and guidance be? How does one have a successful professional life while also maintaining a healthy uh, personal life and, you know, taking care of our own wellness. Well, what we call as ambition is a very constipated expression of fundamental human longing. When I say fundamental human longing, doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you want to be something more than what you are right now. Hello? Hello? Yes or no? If you know money, you're thinking more money. If you know wealth, you're thinking more wealth. If you know power, you're thinking more power. If you know knowledge, you're thinking more knowledge. If you know pleasure, you're thinking more pleasure. Doesn't matter what, currency may be different from person to person, but everybody is longing to be something more. So whatever that something more that you're longing for right now, suppose we fulfill for you, fulfill that for you right now, are you fulfilled for life? Hello? No. You want something more. Okay, that also will do it. Are you fulfilled? No. That also we will fulfill the next one. Are you fulfilled? No. So essentially, you're longing to expand in a limitless way. If you want to become limitless, trying to do it through physical means is a foolish thing to do. Hello? Because the fundamental of physical existence is a defined boundary. We call this a physical body because it has a defined boundary. If I take away all the boundaries of this, it is no more physical, isn't it? So you're longing for something which is boundless through boundaries, well, life is going to be a frustrating course. It can't be any other way, I'm saying it's fundamentally flawed. So, you have a longing to become everything, but your ambition is for something. That's why I'm saying it's constipated. You know constipation means what? It happens, but it happens little by little. Hello? <laughs> so, ambition is a constipated expression of what is a fundamental human longing to expand? So your longing to expand, if you pay attention to it, you will see it is not looking for more, it's looking for all. Hello? When you're looking for all, you can't call that an ambition because you cannot have all in terms of physical having, all right? But you can make everything yours, nobody to stop you. Do you know this? I have made all of you mine. We're not without your permission, is that okay? Whether you give me permission or not, I don't care. I've anyway made you mine. Can you stop me? Hello? Can you stop me? No, you think if somebody has to be yours, you have to marry them or you have to beget them or something else must happen. You need a legal paper that they belong to you. No, 
this planet can be yours, isn't it? Hello? This universe can be yours. It's just a question of, will you allow your consciousness to expand or will you keep it constipated? So first of all, that is ambition. In that, how to balance my personal life and my ambition? See, what you want to do, if it's not your life, why the hell are you doing it? People are always asking how to get work-life balance. I'm saying if what you're doing, your work, if it's not your life, please don't do it. Because if you're reasonably successful in your life, you spend more time with the people with whom you work than your so-called family, yes or no? Day in and day out, you're with them. Maybe only weekends you're seeing family faces. <laughs> Depends what kind of work you're doing, you know. <laughs> but if you're reasonably successful in this world, most of the time you are with people that you work with, isn't it? And if that's not your life, I'm sure it's miserable. It's like, you know, uh, when I first went to the United States some twenty-three, twenty-four years ago, I… they took me to this restaurant and it said uh, TGIF, whatever. What is it, I asked. So, Thank God it's Friday. So, then I looked into this, what is… where does this come from? Then all the research says, studies show that seventy percent of the Americans hate the work that they're doing, hate, not dislike, they hate it. If you are hating what you do for five days of the week, you think two days will be fantastic? No, it only overdoses. That's all that's happening because you're doing something that you hate. I'm saying, Life is such a limited amount of time. In this, where did you get the time to do something that you hate? Why the hell are you doing something that you hate when life is such a brief happening? When I say life is such a brief happening, before you were born, Ananya, how long were you dead? <laughs> well, I don't know. You don't know, endless amount of time probably. And I'll wish you another hundred years. Thank you. Because when it comes to death, nobody is negotiating death, we're only negotiating time. Hello? Yes or no? We are not negotiating whether we should die or not. We are negotiating whether it's today or a hundred years later, that's all. So I'll give you another hundred years, okay? But after that when you die, how long will you be dead? Will I be reborn or...? D don't go into all that. How long will you be dead? Those people who died, how long are they dead? They're just for a dead forever, all right? Forever. Yes. So, you are dead for a very long time before you are born and after you die. It's just a brief amount of time that you're here. In this, why the hell are you doing something that you hate? You must be doing something that you love, something that you embrace with the greatest amount of Love and affection, whether it is work or industry or people or whatever nonsense you want to embrace, it's up to you. Hello? <laughs> so Guruji, coming to this, I personally have reached a stage where uh, I love most of what I do and I feel very grateful to be in this place. However, I still… Uh, I still wonder what's right. So if I can give you an example. Let's say my, my mother's here, so I'm just going to use her as an example. Let's say I have a really important board meeting that I'm chairing tomorrow. And it also happens to be my mom's birthday. Now, the decisions that I make for the company obviously affect so many other people who are working in the company. Uh, but it's also my mom's birthday tomorrow and I want to be there for her. Let's say I can only do one. You can take her to the boardroom and celebrate along with that. <laughs> I would love to do I, I'm going to do that. Thank you. That, that, that would be great. But what I'm trying to get at is wh when things like that come up, what is the right… what is the right thing to do? Or is there nothing right and wrong and it just depends from situation to situation? Uh, this is something that I really struggle with. I think this is what I meant by personal and professional. See, when we say personal life, whether it's our parents or our children or whatever, it is not the volume of time that we spend with them, it's about how we spend that time with them. So I've raised my daughter with my little finger of involvement only, but she thinks I've been a fantastic parent to her, all right? That's her experience and that's all that matters. 
I know, I only let my little finger involve myself with her because rest of it was all involved with my work. But with little finger you can do a lot. It is the quality of what you do, it's not about how much you do. Wow. We have to raise that quality. Wow. Yeah, that's really important. I think it's becoming quite commonplace, in, especially in Gen Z, to do more than just... Hey, what do you mean, Gen Z, you're the last generation? <laughs> Sorry, Guruji, it's just a word that I've gotten off. I know my sister's part of the Gen Z and she's... No, I know, I know what that means, but what I'm saying is, when we say A of life, we mean beginning of life. When we say Z of life, we mean end of life. When you say I'm Gen Z, it's not sounding good to me. That's actually, if you think about it like that, it's actually quite unfortunate. Hopefully they're not the last generation. <laughs> so, I've personally noticed that we tend to do more than just one thing. Um, and given that I'm trying to balance a career in both business and music, is this something that you think is sustainable or should we as individuals be focusing and giving our all to just one field? See, so, yeah. Whether I can ride two horses at a time or one horse at a time is a question of my competence, isn't it? If I can effectively do it, you can ride ten, what's the problem? But if you're going to fall between the horses, better ride one. That's something you must make a decision, it's not about right and wrong. It's a question of you invest your life and time and energy into something. How effective and impactful will you be? Because when we do activity, whatever the nature of our activity, I'm asking you a simple question. Suppose you make music, do you want to make music that nobody wants to listen to? Um, I would love to idly make music f for myself. No, no, don't get all so complicated. I'm asking you a simple question. If you make music, do you want to make music nobody, including yourself, want to listen to? No, no, no. You want people to listen to it. When they listen to your music, if they sit here with tears in their eyes, that's a day, your music, huh? Isn't it? Do you want to write a book that nobody wants to read? Do you want to make a movie nobody wants to see? Do you want to cook something nobody wants to eat? Yeah. No. So essentially you must understand human activity is relevant only in terms of the impact that it causes. So if you can be impactful doing ten things, great. If you cannot be, Choose what's your competence, right? Thank you, Guruji. That that personally really helped me. I hope some of you, I hope this was relevant for some of you. There are not many musicians out here, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, given there's this elephant in the room, uh, and many... Who is that guy? <laughs> um, you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> Given all the biking and everything, I think you're a huge inspiration for all our fitness levels. Um, given the corporate conditions, uh, you know, many people are being asked to leave their workplace. And this is, as a young business person... Uh, leave means fired. Uh, yes, due, laid off, yes. Due, due to, uh, not due to incompetence, but due to the fact that mm -hmm. costs need to be cut to meet the needs of... Uh, the company's... Changing, changing situations. Absolutely. Um, now, in a situation like this, of course, as a, as a young business person, it, it really hurts to see that, you know, you're affecting the livelihoods of... Please fire some more people, I'm looking for uh, attrition. <laughs> I can give a lot of work, no payment, but a lot of work. We are a volunteer organization, you know, we are always looking for people who are willing to work for nothing. <laughs> no, I think everyone seems very happy and that's the end goal, so that's it's lovely. But how do we... it's it's a battle between the heart and the mind. Uh, and it's a, it's a moral... for me personally, it's a moral issue. Um, so how do we reduce this conflict which is good for all versus good for majority? See, uh... There are many changing situations, always there are. You said... Uh, I mean, we got into a different uh, tangent on that. You said right now this generation is facing so many things. 
I am telling you, you are facing the least number of challenges, if you ask me. Because never before, humanity had this level of comfort, convenience, technological empowerment, never before in the history of humanity, were human beings ever this comfortable and this much convenience. So you should never complain, this generation, what shall I call you, S? <laughs> that means if you use that, only twenty-six alphabets are there, let's call you whatever, hundred X. <laughs> All right, because numbers are limitless, if you go by alphabet, somewhere it has to end. So, never before these kind of comforts and conveniences ever been there for human beings. Never before food and survival has been this well organized. And fortunately still, there are many people in the world, you know, there are famines in the world, there are droughts in the world, unfortunately it's there. That is not because of lack of resource, not because of lack of food, in twenty... in twenty... Uh, twelve, I think, in twenty twelve, the study shows that on that... in that year, we were producing food, enough food for eighteen billion people on the planet, but we were only seven-something at that time. But we had food for eighteen billion people, still thirty percent of the population is hungry, they have not eaten properly. So, this is not because of resource, this is because there is no care and concern in our hearts. We... we have not felt for other human beings. Now I'm glad at least you're feeling something, I'm glad about that, that it hurts you to know that somebody is going to be troubled in their life. It's very good, your humanity is alive, please keep it that way. If you just think, you know, there is somebody who wrote a book, you're fired. I don't know who. You don't know. <laughs> so, it's not fun to throw somebody out. If... if we have to re re relieve somebody, we'll have to do it because there's a picture of a larger well-being. But you should not enjoy those things. That shows you're lacking humanity. Hello? Suppose I have to put you into some little bit of trouble, at least I must have some trepidation that unfortunately I have to do this. I enjoy it. This is sickness. Yes or no? Sometimes we are forced to do certain things. Because world is not all properly balanced like this, it's never been and never will be. S many times we are at advantage, somebody is at disadvantage. At least you must have some feeling, even though, even though you can't fix it. Many times you can't fix it, at least your heart should beat a little bit. If that stops, you're forsaken your humanity, please don't do that, it's all right. You... you fire hundred people today and you go suffer tonight, please do that, it's good. It's good for you because deepening your sense of humanity will come a long way in your life, in many, many ways. But there are ways to settle this, for example, I mean, my example may not go well with your kind of business, but anyway, I'm telling you. For example, when pandemic came, all our activity came to standstill because all our activity is mass, you know, people gathering. So we couldn't do that for over two and a half years. So, uh, largely we are a volunteer-run organization, but other kinds of, uh, you know, labor and there are other things which are hired labor and also there are accountants and this and that which are where certain talent is needed, we have many hired people. So, the only way was to relieve them because the foundation was sitting there without any revenue. So, first thing I did was, I curtailed the food of all our people, including myself. I said, let's eat far more simple than what... we eat only two meals a day. In that, I simplified. Because at that time, nobody knew how long it'll last. There were predictions, it will last for three years, five years, like this. So if it happens for five years, where will you go begging for food? Because I have over five thousand people living with me, this is my family, live close family, you know. This is our nuclear family, five thousand <laughs> So, these five thousand people have to be fed, it doesn't matter what happens to the foundation. So first thing is we simplified the food. And uh, next thing is, uh, we told everybody, please, we will have to relieve at least thirty percent of the staff. 
We don't want to do that. Instead of that, everybody take thirty percent cut in your salary. We will make it up when things pick up. Everybody willingly took that cut. So we never fired anybody, we never relieved even a single person, but everybody went down to their salaries were cut by thirty percent. I'm saying there are ways to negotiate situations rather than simply blatantly doing things. That will happen anyway. If it hurts you a little bit, you look for a solution. Not always the same solution, there may be different solutions. It's a great insight for all of us here to find some sort of middle ground so that, you know, things will... Sadhguruji, you spoke about suffering, um, you know, when we... It could be anything, right? It could be pain, um, it could be grief. Uh, of course, it's very important to feel it, but how much do we feel and then at what... at what point do we why do you distract say our mind? Why do you say it's very important to feel it? This is the little learning that I have. I feel like the only way out is through. Um, <laughs> but I may be totally wrong. I thought you heard in the video, I said, the only way out is in. I know, I heard that. I heard that actually and I was going to ask you about that as well. Um, uh, but how much of our pain should we be feeling? How much of it should we be distracted? You, you know, occupational therapy is something that we do. There are, you know, there are things like social media and all of that, our work. Um, what's the right balance there? How does one go about doing that? You don't want to self-loathe in an emotion and, you know, feel... Um, so that's something that I, I struggle with sometimes. You're not talking about physical pain. No, I'm talking about emotional yes, I get you. Right now, my right knee is in a little bit of physical pain, little meniscus, but my left knee is joyful, okay <laughs> So that keeps me joyful. <laughs> Now, I want you to understand this. Pain or pleasure, where did you experience it? Where? Mm -hmm. My heart area, I think. No, 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 don't... Outside? Outside or inside? Oh, inside. Inside. Joy or misery, where did you experience it? Inside. Inside. Agony or ecstasy, where did you experience it? Inside. inside. Light or darkness, where are you experiencing it? Inside also. Inside only. So every human experience is happening only within you. What happens within you must happen your way, isn't it? I may not happen your way, these people may not happen your way, but you must happen your way, isn't it? What happens within you must happen your way. World will never happen hundred percent your way. Anybody? Your world is happening hundred percent your way? No, not your husband, not your wife, not your children. So giving up on all of them, you got yourself a dog, but he does his own thing. <laughs> Even they do their own thing <laughs> these days. So nothing ever happens hundred percent your way when it comes to the world. If fifty-one percent is happening your way, you have the controlling stake, okay? That's good enough. Fifty-one percent, good. You try hundred percent, nobody will be around you, they'll be gone. Yes or no? If somebody around you tries to make it their way hundred percent, will you be there? You're gone, it doesn't matter who they are. So, you must understand, nobody and no situation ever happens hundred percent your way. Little bit my way, little bit your way, little bit somebody else's way. It's good because if everything happened your way, where do I go? I'm glad it's not happening your way. It's happening little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way. But what happens within me must happen my way, isn't it? Hello? So if this happened your way, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? Or would you have managed some space for grief, pain, this, that, nonsense? No, I, I would choose... I don't know about all of you, uh, cho bliss, right? Choose, choose, choose. Blissfulness or misery? Please choose, I'm going to bless you. <laughs> Blissfulness, I think we all agree. <laughs> so, if you had a choice, that's what you would do. Where... how did you lose this choice? You lost this choice because you have no distinction between what is you and what is around you. Wow, okay. You've lost the distinction. If you know this is me, 
Here you do what you want, here you keep this blissful. Outside, sometimes happens our way, sometimes doesn't happen our way, some things go the way we want, some things go right against us, all kinds of things. The more… Act, the more your spread of activity, more things won't happen your way. So if you want ninety percent of your life at least happening your way, you must just live in your bedroom. There also cockroaches won't listen to you, mosquitoes won't listen to you, they do their own thing, all right? I'm saying the moment you think world should happen my way, otherwise I can't be there, you will just limit… limit the scope of your life, that's all that'll happen. If you understand, this will never happen your way hundred percent, but you can push it in the direction that you want to whatever extent you can, but this one must happen my way. So you already chosen its blissfulness. Make this blissful, just get into the world and see. Some things work, some things don't work, everything is fine with you because you're blissful. Now, your experience of life is determined by somebody else and something else. Now you're a slave. Now you're terrified of everything. Now, in knowingly or unknowingly, you make yourself into a very constipated life because the fear of suffering. If you are joyful by your own nature, if you are blissful by your own nature, you have no fear of suffering. Only when you have no fear of suffering, you will walk full stride. Otherwise, you are just half a step all your life. Don't do that to yourself. And how do we overcome fear of suffering? You don't have to overcome fear of suffering. Suffering is caused by you. See, I can take a pin and put it… I won't, I'm, I'm just… Uh, <laughs> I can take a pin, pin and put it in your body right now, I can poke you. You can cry or you can laugh, the choice is still there, isn't it? Absolutely. Somebody wh whom you love very much, if they cause pain to you, don't you laugh? Hello? Hello? Your child beat you up in the face, not intentionally but like that. Didn't you laugh? How nicely he smashed you up <laughs> He peed on you, didn't you laugh? <laughs> because it's not about what they're doing, it's about how you're responding. Your life or your experience of life is determined by either you're responding to life or you're compulsively reacting to life. This is the difference between being conscious and unconscious. If you're a conscious response, this one will happen the way you want. If you're a compulsive reaction, this one will happen the way they want. Thank you, Kuluji. I didn't point at anybody, I pointed there, okay? <laughs> I think many of us, uh, you know, our companies have a larger vision um, of achieving something, uh, of creating impact more than just financially or maybe even financially. Um, and then there are, in, there are individuals which make up the team. What's the best way to align everyone to that larger vision? I must tell you, this happened somewhere around Delhi, not in Delhi, close to Delhi. Uh, almost twelve, fifteen years ago, I'm doing a event for one of the, you know, the top mega multinational companies, so one of the top companies. Top twenty-five of their management are there. And uh, I have nine volunteers with me. Our nine… our volunteers are always on their toes. Nobody needs to tell them what to do, what not to do, they're simply on. So these people see on the second day, they ask, Sadhguru, where do you get such people? <laughs> because they're looking for attrition. <laughs> then I say, you don't get them, you got to make them. How do we make them? I said, you must make them fall in love with you. How do we do that? I said, first you must fall in love with them. Oh, they don't pay us for that <laughs> So when you're looking at life only in… if you're looking at life as a transaction, you will not be a life, you'll be a marketplace. A marketplace is always dependent on profit and loss. Life is not like that. Life is a progression of experiences, all right? But if you made your life into a transaction, then the question is not about how much you have, what you got, where you went, no. 
Just before this Save Soil movement, I was campaigning in United States for support. At that time, around me, there is one young man. He's behaving like his tail is on fire. I said, hey, what are you up to? Sadhguru, I want to make one billion dollars, I want to make one billion dollars. I said, that's all, you come tomorrow morning, I'll give you a billion dollars. Really? I said, yes, you come tomorrow, I'll give you a billion dollars. He had eight friends with him who were sitting quietly. I said, see these eight guys, I'm going to give all of them ten billion dollars tomorrow morning. Sadhguru, Sadhguru, why they're getting ten, I'm getting… Aray, you wanted only one just now. <laughs> Now one billion dollar is valuable only if others don't have it. If everybody has it, I… it's not enough. So essentially, you enjoy what other people don't have. This is not joy, this is sickness. Hello? You enjoy what others don't have. Is it joy or sickness? It's sickness. If you give up this sickness, you will do the best that you can do in your life. Am I the best? There is no such thing, all right? There is no such thing as the best. The best that you can do in this life, if the times in which you live allows that, that's a great benediction. Because lot of things that we are doing are a consequence of the times in which we exist. Yes or no? If you were here five hundred years ago, would you be talking all this corporate stuff? No, definitely not. So it is the times in which we exist which has allowed us to do certain things, let's do our best. That is whatever potential you have should find expression. If you are doing something significant, where do you have the time to see whether this guy has it or not? If you see what you're doing is very significant, you don't have time to see who's got what, who's doesn't have what. And whether they have it or don't have it doesn't make a difference because what you're doing is significant enough. So if you understand what is significant enough, every other barrier will be crossed. You know, we are a volunteer organization. Can I say something volunteers, I take permission? <laughs> volunteer organization means nobody is trained for the job, okay? Everybody is enthusiastic, everybody wants to do everything, but they're not trained for the job. And you can never fire them for inefficiency because they're volunteers, you didn't hire them, <laughs> all right? So, this is a different kind of management. If you want to go crazy, come and manage Isha Foundation, <laughs> like that. But all our events, everything, they work like clockwork. Before corona, now it's come down a little bit, we'll pick it up now, it's gone into various other areas. Otherwise, on an average over 260 to 270 events, were happening on any given day. Not a single event has been abandoned ever in the last thirty years. So that must be good management, all right? So our events generally happen, I'm telling you not to boast about ourselves, but to congratulate all these untrained people, untrained, unpaid people, because our events happen in clockwork. I have been to literally everywhere, everywhere in the world, the biggest events, economic forums, this, that. Nowhere will events happen with the efficiency that it happens in Isha Foundation, I'm saying this. I'm saying this as a congratulation to all of them, because that's a level of dedication to the process that they're doing. They may not be qualified, but they're devoted to what they're doing, which makes a huge difference. So, the important thing is, that people around you should be inspired. They must see that they're doing something significant in their life. If… if you… I don't ever pay them, but even if you don't pay one month's salary, they won't mind if they're doing something really important. Right now, they're just doing a job, thank God it's Friday, they're in that mode, all right? So, that inspiration has not happened in most businesses, unfortunately. I'm not saying everywhere, there are people who have managed to inspire, but that needs to happen because what is the point living with people who are dragging their feet? I can't live with them. You don't want to do it, don't do it. But when you take something up, you must be agile, you must be there, all right? You must see it's important because if it's not important, why the hell are you doing it? No, because I'll get money, I'm doing it. 
that's a bad way to live because this is a brief life, as I told you. We are dead for a very long time. We are only alive for a little bit of time. We must be doing what we love to do, what really matters. Hello? And when I say what I love to do, should I do music, should I do dance, should I do this, should I do that, it's not about that. See, if you really look at yourself as a human being, what impacts people most? With what kind of activity can you really touch another life? That's what you wish to do, whatever it is. You can touch people with business, you can touch people with industry, you can touch people with politics, with spirituality, with art, music, in every way you can touch. Only thing is, what is your consciousness? Are you doing this to make yourself great or are you doing this because you genuinely want to touch another life? So once you touch another life, why do you call a handful of people your family and the rest are out? Because somewhere you touch their lives and you're only able to touch one or two lives in your entire life, it's a constipated life. You must be able to touch a lot of people. Hello? Yes or no? You must be able to profoundly impact lots of people, then everybody feels like family to you. So if everybody is feeling like family with you, or family means not in the usual structure, I'm saying they're really, you know, looking up to you because they know what you're doing is significant and it's significant for them, they'll do their best and of course you'll pay their salaries. And if everybody is agile and doing their best, that's the best you can get out of anybody, isn't it? Guruji, you had mentioned that leadership means partnership, cooperation, mentoring and support and not dominance, which is lovely. I guess, how do we as leaders keep our ego in check? Where is your ego? Show me. I'll fix it right now. <laughs> Where is it? Somewhere within my system, I guess. Where? Tell me, is it in your foot? No, I think my upper body somewhere. <laughs> You can only make guesses. Your dentures? Dentures? Dentures, I'm asked. Real teeth. Yeah, is it in... No, I'm... Oh, oh, oh. It's called denture. I didn't mean to say artificial dentures. <laughs> See, you're Generation Z, huh? you use language in a certain way. No, Guruji, I'm not Gen Z. I'm... I'm a millennial, I think. You're why? I'm why. I'm why. I'm why. So, why is a good generation? No, why is a good generation? Whatever you s see, you ask why. <laughs> That's a good generation. Very true. <laughs> we do question a lot, I think. Question? I don't think… I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Question is never a problem. As I told you before we came here, people are always saying, Sadhguru, can I ask any question? Uh, because I don't want to ask a wrong question. I say, how can a question be wrong? Only an answer can be wrong. That's my problem. I may say something wrong. When you're asking a question, how can you ask a wrong question? Is there such a thing? That is only in the, you know, high school examination, they asked you a wrong question <laughs> Have I answered that question? No. No, 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 you have <laughs> I was just taken in with your sense of humor. <laughs> so, uh, see, leadership means people think it's power. No, leadership is a sacrifice. Leadership is a, a larger embrace of life. When you sit here and think, your thought is not about, you know, like this young man was saying, I want to make one billion dollars. This is personal ambition. If you're a leader, you're thinking how you can make a difference for all these people, all right? Whoever is in your perspective. So leadership means in some way, you sacrifice so many things, other people eat on time, leaders don't eat on time. <laughs> Others sleep on time, we never sleep on time. We don't know when food and sleep will come to us. We don't know where we will sleep. If I sleep in the same… on the same pillow two nights, it's a luxury, all right? <laughs> well, people may think this is fantastic, yes it is, if you feel it that way. But if you think you are doing somebody else's work, it can become terribly burdensome, hello? It can become a killing process, but if you see you're doing something significant and this is what you wish to do, then what you do, leadership is not a… leader, see, first of all, 
Anybody calling themselves a leader is... I think it's quite ugly. You never say, I want to be a leader. People should say, by what you're doing, oh, she's a leader. I am a leader, I am a leader. This is a very gross thing to do. Hello? Other people should feel this is a leader. Why would somebody see you as a leader? See, if you sit here, right now we are sitting on the stage. Compared to people who are sitting in the audience, we have a little better view of everything. This is what leadership means. They put you on a perch. Once they put you on a perch, if you don't see better than others, you will make an utter fool of yourself. This is very important. So, you sit on a perch means you must see better. Maybe all of them are working harder than you, but you see better. Because you see better, they'll put you up there. It's like a... you know, if you... in a small world like a ship on a vessel, the captain does nothing, he just dresses himself nicely. <laughs> Usually ship captains are like that. Everybody is working their lives out, but they are all looking up to him because he sees... he sees what others cannot see. Hello? That's an important thing. So once you're a leader, you must have an insight that you are able to see something that others cannot see. It's just this. Successful leader means just that. What they see tomorrow, you see today. That's all. Thank you, Guruji. That was really very insightful. That really helped. Thank you so much. And you must be able to inspire people. Because if you don't have an inspired lot around you, for whatever reason, whether you throw money around and inspire them, or you inspire them with your own activity, how you inspire them, it doesn't matter. They must be inspired. Otherwise, you're not getting the best out of people, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. What are your thoughts around AI? Should we, um, as business people, artists, human beings rather, should we be embracing it? Uh, because of course it does make things more convenient, or is it something that should be, you know, not encouraged at all? See, in 2017 and 2018, I was invited <laughs> for a lot of artificial intelligence conferences. I said, why me, you know? I'm not an artificial intelligence, why... I'm not... I'm not a technical person. Why are you calling me for these artificial intelligence conferences? So all these professors and academics who are there in these kind of places, they're saying, we are all really worried that we will lose our jobs. I said, I'm so glad academics lose their jobs, means it's a joy, all right? <laughs> then uh, they, s they said, uh, you know, when we look at you, probably if everything becomes AI, you are the only guy who will be relevant, so we want you to tell us what is it. I said, see, this you must have foreseen beforehand, you did not foresee. I foresee this long time ago. Anything that you can accumulate, data-wise, in your mind. You can accumulate certain data, process, analyze and throw it out. This a machine can do better than you. Anything I want to lift this with my hand, maybe I'm very strong, I can lift you with the furniture, but a machine can do it better than me, yes or no? I remember in seventies, nobody old enough to be, in seventies, sir? No, no. <laughs> so, ge Generation W, is it? <laughs> Whatever, in seventies, uh, there was news all over saying that in Mazagon docks, the coolies have all gone on strike. Why means they were setting up the first gantry in Mazagon docks. Till then, those days the largest ships were approximately 125,000 tons. To unload a 125,000 ton ship, they were taking 24 to 28 days one ship. Today, a quarter million ton ships are unloaded within 24 hours because of machines. So those days they all went on strike. If this gantry comes, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do with our muscle? 
I told them, see, this is what the coolies were doing, this is what the academics are talking right now, if AI comes, what are we supposed to do? All the coolies, what are they doing now? You must ask them and you must do that <laughs> All right? <laughs> I'm saying, every time a convenience comes, somebody is going to lose his job because he was doing that job, all right? So with AI comes, essentially, I would like to move towards a world where nobody has to do any work for their living. Living is taken care of because machines do everything. What you want to do, only that you do. Fantastic world or no? Hello? Right now we have everybody working, especially in the West if you go, people ask me, what do you do for a living? I said, I breathe <laughs> Hello? For a living, what are you doing <laughs> right now? Their idea is because you have you know, <laughs> put your uh, life on lease doing something just to earn a living. It's a terrible way to live, that you work 365 days all your life just to earn a living. This is not what a human being is designed for, okay? Because once you come as a human being, your ability to be, you must understand this, this we must settle, you're the only one on this planet, you're the only species rather, whatever generation alphabet you are, you're called a human being. Did you call a tiger a tiger being, an ant, an ant being, an elephant, an ele elephant being? No, they're all creatures, you're a being. What this means is, you're the only one who are capable of determining how to be. If you knew how to be, what is the problem? Hello? If you knew how to be blissful or miserable, what's the choice? Blissful. Blissful. So if you knew how to be, what is the problem with life? Whatever you can do, you will do your best and when it's your time, you go. Hello? Yes or no? Only because you don't know how to be, you are making a signs of all your misunderstanding of life. I'm going to just put another question in because I'm selfish, <laughs> I'm being greedy. How do we remain attached enough to enjoy what life has, yet detached enough so that we can live without materialistic things around us? It's a very Indian problem. <laughs> Attachment, detachment. So, how to be involved and not entangled, that's a question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> See, uh, people are saying, because uh, they are uh, reading Bhagavad Gita with half a brain. <laughs> no, because they all say, only my left works, my right works, whatever, you know. People these days, it's fashionable to say, my left brain says this, my right brain says this. So half a brain is working. With that, they read Gita <laughs> and they come to their own conclusions. That Krishna said, you should not be attached. You forget about what he said or he might not have said. Look at his life. Is he an embodiment of involvement or is he detachment? Involvement, isn't it? Absolute involvement in small things, big things, everything is absolutely involved. You're accusing that man of teaching you detachment. This is because you're looking at everything with your half a brain. They're openly admitting, people are admitting, my left brain says this, my right brain says that. <laughs> so half a brain shouldn't make such conclusions about everything. With a full brain, you still can't make conclusions because the nature of creation is so complex. If you spend a million years here, you still won't figure out one thing from the other. Right now you are talking about you being tiny and significant at the same time. See, where this cosmos begins, where it ends, neither the religious people know, nor the men of science know. Yes or no? Nobody has figured it out. So in this seemingly endless cosmos, beginningless, endless cosmos, here we are 
sitting on a tiny little mud ball that we call as planet Earth. And the damn thing is spinning and traveling at a tremendous speed and we are sitting here nicely and talking all this. This is definitely not our making, isn't it? Hello? Not our making. And we have no clue in this cosmos where exactly… Do you have a geo drop? You know, the Google drop you have, where you are in this cosmos? No. You have no clue whether you are at the end of the cosmos, beginning of the cosmos, being crushed by something or thrown away somewhere, you don't know anything. And we are fine, hello? We are quite fine, isn't it? <laughs> so this is the nature of our existence. Countless number of people before you and me, you know, you are Z but ABC, all those people, they've all come and gone. When they lived, they also thought they are great men. They also thought they are very smart. They also thought they are very significant. Where are they right now? All topsoil. Uh, not you, me also. This also will be topsoil. Me too, me too. Much later, hundred years later. But this also will become topsoil in a little while. Now, uh, when we are sitting here, we just a small pop-up on this planet. We'll pop out. We think this is my life and I'm so important. As far as the earth is concerned, you, it's just recycling its soil. <laughs> Hello? Yes or no? So when you look at all this, how can I go to my office tomorrow? What is the use? See, this is because you're always trying to draw a conclusion with every realization. Don't draw a conclusion. The moment you draw a conclusion, that'll be your last realization. So, life is a progression of realizations. As you realize more and more and more, life becomes more and more beautiful and magnificent. But every time you realize something, you want to take notes and say, this is it. This is not it. If you live, this is not it. If you die, this is not it. This is the nature of life. Thank you, Guruji. Thank you so much. Over the questions, all of you, any of you, yes. Uh, can we? Can you help with the mic? One of the things that you said, Guruji, is about uh, we all should try and do what we love to do. No, I didn't say that. And and would I, 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 I'm trying to I'm trying to outline one thought, sir. To be able to love what we do, is that not therefore also a matter of situation, Guruji? See, first of all, I did not say you must do what you love to do. Then everybody will start doing fanciful things, all right? Because at different stages in your life, you will think different things you love. When you were eighteen, you thought you loved somebody in the neighborhood, but that passed, isn't it? It's okay, you don't have to confess, it's not a quote. So, <laughs> but I'm saying, when you're fifteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, whatever you thought, this is it. What you thought you love, did it disappear? Not only in terms of people, of things that you do. When you were five, you loved a lollipop, that was the highest thing in your life. Yes or no? Was lollipop a small thing? It was the world. Hello? Lollipop was the world at that… that stage in your life. So don't try to do what you think you love to do. See, if you are a foolish person, you will do things that you suffer and you think you're doing great because you suffer for everybody. No, your suffering will never bring well-being for others. If you don't know how to keep this one joyful, how will you create joy for anybody for that matter? This is a lot of miserable people taking on this role, I am miserable because I want everybody to be happy. This will never work. If you're an intelligent person, you will do reasonably what you like to do. But if you unfold your genius, you will see that you can do anything, anything that is necessary today, you can do it joyfully.
Instead of looking at it that way, we already sort of established this, but the question anyway came up. See, if you had a choice how to be, you also said blissful or did you say miserable? Blissful. So if you're blissful, whatever is needed you will do naturally, isn't it? This activity or that activity, what difference does it make? See, people come to our center. They say, Sadhguru, I'm qualified, I'm a doctor, I'm uh, this kind of PhD. I say, all right, work, uh, you know, cut carrots in the kitchen. Because today that's what is needed, not that we're taking pleasure in putting them there. Today that's what is needed, other things are being taken care of, nobody do carrot cutters are missing. You cut the carrot, all right <laughs> So you don't think that is less, you know, like I must tell you this. One twelve, twelve-year-old boy writes a letter to me, a four-page letter, this is a few years ago. And uh, he writes a long letter saying how you know, he wants to make his life, how he doesn't want to be like his parents and uh, just earning a living and da da da. I was just surprised, a twelve-year-old boy, it's too mature for twelve years, the kind of letter he's written to me, I said, I want to see this boy. So then he came. Then I said, uh, all this is fine, but why are you thinking that the way your parents… because your parents are stupid, that's why they produced you, all right? Hello? If they were so smart as you, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> if they had the same thoughts and they were as smart as you are, you wouldn't exist. They were stupid, so they produced you. And now you're talking all this, and now you want to do big spiritual things, there's no such thing. See, you understand this. See, our temple, the Analinga temple, a meditation place, opens exactly at six o'clock on the dot. People will wait like this, when it comes stuck, they'll open the door. So I said, see, tomorrow, suppose the temple does not open at six o'clock, simply it's closed. People will all come, what's happening, what's happening, why is it not open? Then they'll think, oh, maybe today some… something Sadhguru is going to do something big, maybe that's why they're preparing, it's closed, something, they'll think up their own thing. Every day for the last thirty years, without, you know, once again to acknowledge all the volunteers, without a single day's break, every day meal has been served at ten o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the evening, without a single minute delay, always. So, suppose you go to the dining hall and it didn't open, then you'll think, why the hell dining hall is not open, little hungry people will get little angry, dark bus, then somebody will explain. Maybe there is something else today, maybe today is a festival, maybe today is some special day, maybe they'll serve something else a little later, they'll come up with explanations. But let's say you wake up, you know, everything starts at 5.30 in the morning sadhana, suppose you wake up at 4.30, all toilets are locked. In one hour's time, there'll be a revolution. So I asked him, which is more important, the toilet, Dining hall, kitchen, temple, which one is more important? You better understand, the moment you think one thing is more important than the other, you have lost it. Tell me, which is more important? Sitting in the temple and meditating is more important? Sitting in the toilet for a shit is more important? We, there is no such thing. When we do all of it, life becomes important, isn't it? If you don't do any one of those things, life will be a mess, yes or no? So the problem is this, when you say, I will do what I like to do, what I love to do, somewhere in your mind, you've decided what is superior, what is inferior, what is worth doing, what is not worth doing. This will go away in you the moment you're blissful by your own nature. Whatever is needed, you do. Different people will function according to their competence, but what is needed you do at that given moment. So, do not distinguish as, I love to do this, I don't like to do that. If you're joyful, you see on a day when you're joyful, how flexible you are, hello, how wonderful you are, I would like to meet you on that day when you're very happy, what a wonderful human being you are. Another day you're little unhappy, 
little dragging your feet, little depressed, frustrated about something, or you could be a nasty human being, isn't it? This is true with every human being. This is the mistake we have made about humanity. We try to produce good people. Good people are insufferable. Yes, those who think I'm very good are usually people that you don't want to live with. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> we need more joyful and sensible people. Can I tell a joke to him? It's a lawyer. So this happened. I'll, I'll tell him a joke because he's a lawyer, he must laugh. <laughs> because it's a dreary, serious place, you know, where he goes. <laughs> so on a certain day, Shankaran Pillai called his three sons. And he said, you good-for-nothing people, you idiots, go do something good in the world. They said, Father, we don't know how to do any good thing. How do we do good things? We don't know any such thing. Said, go help somebody, do something, something good you do. So they all went out. In the evening, one first son came back. Shankaran Pillai asked, did you do any good thing? He said, yes, father, I helped a old lady cross the street. Very good. Second son came. You? Yes, father, what did you do? I helped a old lady to cross the street. Third son came. What did you do? He also said, I also helped a old lady to cross the street. He said, what? All three of you found three old ladies to cross the street? He said, no father, you don't know how stubborn these old ladies are. Whatever we did, she wouldn't come. We also called our cousin, Ramu. Together all four of us held the four limbs and made her cross the street. But she wouldn't. <laughs> you can do good things like this. <laughs> Anyone else? Is that okay, Guruji? Mm -hmm. I'm a professional comedian and I also do executive coaching. My question is, how can I improve my skills in <laughs> engaging the people better and improving how they have their learning journeys? See, if you understand you're very stupid, you can be funny. If you think you're smart, it's very hard to be funny. No, people are not getting it. <laughs> See, See, the thing is, as we already went through, we are a tiny speck in this universe, da-da-da. We don't know a damn thing. Hello? We've assumed all kinds of things. We've assumed and invented all kinds of things to somehow bring some solace to ourselves. We don't know a damn thing. This is a fact. Yes or no? Neither religions nor science knows a real damn thing about what is life. We know a few things for practical purposes. Beyond that, we don't know anything. How is our existence happening here in the middle of nowhere? No, God created us. Well, you must be a nursery school child to go with that story. Anyway, the important thing is, if you really look at existence, if you look at one leaf, if you look at it for one whole life, you will not still understand it. You're pretty stupid, isn't it? If you understand, that in the larger int intelligence of this existence, your intelligence is such a puny little thing, then you will be funny naturally. If you think you are smart, then it's very hard to be funny because <laughs> if you cannot laugh at yourself, how can you laugh at somebody? You'll be sick if you simply laugh at other people, isn't it? <laughs> How do I find that perfect spot between contentment and chasing an ambition? Basically, the reality of my life and the expectation that I have of it. See, uh, contentment means containment. Why would you want to contain yourself? Because you're afraid if you over overstep, you may suffer. This is what I've been talking from the beginning. If you know how to be blissful by your own nature, 
one thing that happens to you is, you have no fear of suffering. Only when you have no fear of suffering, you can walk full stride, no problem. Because what happens outside of you, does not change the experience of your life. You know, we are doing huge projects around the world. Whatever we can do, everything. People around me some, sometimes say, Sadhguru, this is, if we take this, we don't know whether we'll do this, whether it can, we'll be successful in making this happen. I say, why are you worried about success? It's about doing what we think is needed. It may work, it may not work. Anyway, shall I tell you my problem? Can I? share my problem with you. This happened, this is the fortieth year that I am teaching like this. It started in 1982. So, uh, on that day, I just sat in one place and suddenly I exploded into an ecstatic state where like every cell in my body is dripping ecstasy. And I thought I'm sitting there for ten, fifteen minutes, but when I opened my eyes, about four and a half hours had passed. For the first time, Tears, me and tears were impossible. Tears to a point my shirt is all wet. I'm sitting there for four and a half hours, dripping ecstasy, there's no way to describe this. I'm a super skeptical person at that time. I'm a hardcore atheist at the time. And then I shake my head and think, what's happening to me? Maybe I'm going off my rocker. Then I ask my closest friends, you know, something is happening to me, if I close my eyes, I'm gone. That, come on, what did you pop tell me? The, those were the days of mushrooms and this and that. Come on, what did you take, where did you get it? I knew there was no point talking to anybody, because there was no context to what was happening within me. I am not raised in any spiritual whatever. We were not forced to practice any religion at home. Very agnostic kind of family, so I've barely ever been to a temple or a puja or anything in my life. So I don't know anything, all I know is I've hit a gold mine. If I close my eyes, I'm gone. So uh, this started happening more and more in about six to eight weeks, it got established like a living experience. Then I sat down and made a plan. I was only twenty-five. I sat down and made a plan. On that day, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. I just thought, who? Who wouldn't want to be absolutely ecstatic for no reason? Simply, if you close your eyes, you're gone, boom. Who wouldn't want it? I couldn't imagine one idiot on the planet who wouldn't want it. So 5.6 billion people, I made a plan, in two and a half years' time, I will make everybody blissful. Here I am forty years later <laughs> Population has become eight billion, generation Z has come, <laughs> X, Y, Z, whatever. And uh, today people say we've touched over two billion people, but that's not my idea of a humanity, it's eight billion plus. So, I'm destined to be a failure. I will die a failure, I know this, but I will die a blissful failure. Do you want to be a blissful failure or a successful constipated person. You are six… you think you're successful because you set up such small goals for yourself. I did it, I did it. What's the point of that? You set up something that is larger than yourself, something that you cannot do in this lifetime. If you take two steps, somebody will take the next step. So my blessing is you must die a blissful failure. Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> they say, try and understand a human being and understand what others think about you. And my struggle is, am I looking at others to understand myself or do I try and understand myself? Is there a way to understand self? So, this is a choice you have. Please sit down, I'm sorry. But uh, you must uh, rephrase your uh, introduction, this is not a small question, <laughs> okay? <laughs> So, uh, this is a choice that you have with your life. Do you want to understand this life or do you want to experience this life? This is a choice, make the choice first. Because 
you thinking I understood life, anybody who thinks they have understood life, they've just drawn their own conclusions, that's all. People who think they understand life, everybody around thinks is a bloody nutcase. Yes or no? You experience your life. If you experience your life, are you experiencing it in a joyful way or a miserable way? This is the only choice you have. As I said earlier, the problem with us is, we have always been the religions of the world especially, not so much in this culture, but the religions of the world have largely ta been talking about understanding life. In this culture, we don't understand life. We just want to profoundly experience our life. How to make our experience life more profound than the way it is right now, this is the goal of this culture. But we have… we have become so much westernized, see all of you are in jackets though it is summer, so we are very westernized <laughs> So, because of that we are thinking of understanding, we are thinking of being good human beings. We don't need good human beings. Because people who think they are very good, they're the ones who do the most terrible things. Right now a suicide bomber thinks he's doing a very good thing. If he doesn't… if he did not think so, he wouldn't throw your… his life at it, isn't it? Hello? If he thought he's doing a worthless thing, would he sacrifice his life? He believes that he is doing a very good thing. So please don't do good things, they are dangerous. If you're joyful and sensible, do the most sensible thing around you, do the most appropriate thing around you right now, because our actions are relevant to the times in which we exist. It's not independent of the times in which we exist, yes? All our actions are not independent of the times in which we exist. It's not all ours, it is where we are, accordingly we act. So this is your action. We are always trying to fix the action. You must understand, action is a consequence of how you are. But today your education is training how to act. Nobody is telling you how to be. Because of that, no matter what you do, in the end you're confused. See, I don't know if you've been around people who pass, you know. If you've been around the last moments when people pass, you will see eighty percent of the people are not in pain, not in fear, they're just bewildered. Because they misunderstood their psychological drama as life. Right now it's happening to all of you, I'm telling you. You're misunderstanding your thought and emotion as life. This is your drama, you can play this drama whichever you way you want. If you're a good director, the drama ends the way you want. If you're a bad director, <laughs> it goes out of hand. It's your drama, isn't it? Hello? Right now, what dialogues are going on within you, it is your drama or no? Are you a good director that you will make it the way you want? Or are you such a lousy director, it just runs away by itself? So you're misunderstanding psychological drama as life process. You will pay for this, but unfortunately most people don't realize this till the last moment comes, you will see they're bewildered because life didn't even begin but it's getting over. This is what is happening. No, this is not what should happen, you must experience your life. What is there to understand? What will you understand? You will draw conclusions, isn't it? Life means this, life means that. Can I tell you a story? This happened. In 1924, there was a bishop in the Greek Orthodox Church. Greek Orthodox Church, uh, they have their own pope in Istanbul, it was Constantinople at that time, but they've become a small group now, at one time they were a very influential group. So this bishop, being in Istanbul or Constantinople, you know, it's on the Silk Route, all these exotic stories from India and China washing across the Bosphorus, he's been hearing so many things about mysticism, mystics, all kinds of yogis and variety of things. 
So he always had this desire, he wanted to go to India and meet a real yogi or a mystic. But being a man of cloth, he couldn't decide where he goes, time passed, he was over sixty years of age. Then he got an opportunity to come to India, he came to southern India, he had a good guide who took him somewhere and said, if you go up this mountain, he gave some directions and said, there is one cave where there is a yogi, he is the man for you. So our man, bishop, walked up, uh, mountains are not kind to you unless you kept yourself well, you know <laughs> You may be very fit in the city, once you go in the mountains, it's a different story. So our bishop went huffing, puffing, then he reached this place, in front of a cave, a yogi was sitting blissed out. So he had been told, if you see an Indian yogi, you must prostrate. But you know, there are objections. <laughs> so with great difficulty, he went down and scraping his knees and making all that uh, fuss, he got up. Yogi heard this commotion and slowly opened his eyes and smiled. Then the bishop asked, can you ask, can I ask you a question? The yogi said, by all means. Then the bishop asked, what is life? Is what you're asking right now. Now he's six, over sixty years of age, now asking what is life. You should have asked this question when you were eight. When you were eight, you have the intelligence to ask this question. But maybe you were too playful, you did not ask. At least when you're sixteen, you should have asked, because at that is a time questions will plague you. You somehow dodged that also. Now you are over sixty, you're asking, good, better late than never, at least you're asking now. So when he asked, what is life? The yogi went into raptures, ah, life, life is like the fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring, spring breeze. So what? Fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze? My teacher told me, life is like a thorn. Once it gets into you, if you sit, it hurts, if you stand, it hurts, if you lie down, it hurts. <laughs> For most people, it's become like that, isn't it? Whatever they do or they don't do, it hurts. If they do something, it hurts. If they don't do that, it hurts. Then you are saying life is a… is like fragrance of jasmine upon gentle spring breeze. So yogi said, ha, huh, that's his life. So I'm saying, <clears throat> this life, what you call as life, is not a defined quantity. You can make it what you want. This is the beauty of our, beauty of our existence. Instead of making it a profound experience and a constant exploration, you want to define. Because if you want to understand, you must define, isn't it? You cannot understand something which is not defined. The moment you're defined, you're already in a box. No, I'm being gentle with the box, yeah. you understand? <laughs> yeah. It's been absolutely enlightening, enlightening uh, conversation and uh, uh, just made me think and just wonder that sometimes you have a uh, perception of what you think you are. Then there's one perception of what people think you are and then there's a third of what you think people think you are. You're thinking too much <laughs> <laughs> That's part Guruji, of my see, see where I get the overthinking from <laughs> <laughs> No, there is no such thing as How? overthinking. How? Yep. Is it necessary that all three Need should match. Does it need to be in harmony? And if it is not, then does it mean that you're not in harmony with the universe? See, only when we are dead, we are the way people want us to be. <laughs> because they can make whatever they want out of us. <laughs> when we are... What... you know what you are, but sometimes people... No, no. You, you know what you think you are. 
all right? That's how the question started. You think you are this, they think you are that, now you think they may be thinking something else. All right, so it's all a thought. Thought, you can make it any way you want. Right now, as an experiment, all of you, if you… if it helps to close your eyes, do this. Otherwise, with eyes open, if you can do it, clo eyes closed is better. Think of a tiger, can you? Hello? Yes. Yes. Think of a flower, mm. can you? A mountain, you can. So I'm saying you can think what you want, whatever you want. But right now, you have given up that choice. Now you are thinking has become a rut, it thinks in a certain way. So that is not called thinking. The word thinking means you consciously generate a certain thought that is thinking. Otherwise, it's called mental diarrhea. It's simply running. So if it's simply running, why is thought process simply running? See, suppose my hand is simply jumping. <laughs> what will you think? Oh, maybe Sadhguru has some ailment. If your… if your mind is simply jumping around, what should I think? <laughs> Same thing. Only thing is, nobody else can see. That's the only comfort you have, but that's not true. If somebody pays enough attention, they can see. So, this is not one person's problem. This is because there's a fundamental flaw in how we perceive ourselves. When I say how we perceive ourselves, what we call our, as our body. Were you born like this, ma? Just like this? You were just this much. Smaller? <laughs> Yes, she was also small, you can't believe that <laughs> Oh, my mother small, no, 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 she was only this much, slowly it became this much. How? How? What made it like this? Food that we eat, isn't it? So what you call as my body is accumulation of the food that you've eaten. The food that you've eaten, it's just a piece of the planet, isn't it? We get it now, it's great. Otherwise, one day when they bury us, we will get it anyway. There's no problem about realization. When will it happen is the only question. If it happens soonest, we'll live one way. If it happens latest, we die one way, okay? So, body is an accumulation, am I correct? Yes. What you call as my mind? This is an accumulation of impressions that you have taken in. What you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, from this you have accumulated so much. Anything that you accumulate can be yours, can never be you, isn't it? Right now I am sitting here, suddenly I pick up this vessel and say, this is my vessel. You will say, it looks like Sadhguru has a problem. Why is he saying such a thing? But then you say, okay, let us listen some more. Everybody says he is wise. <laughs> After some time, I say, this is me. Then you'll say, let's go. Because this is a clear case, isn't it? But this is happening to you every day. Food appears on your plate, you say, this is my food, you eat it and then you say, this is me. You are thinking the accumulations that you have as myself, and this is not stopping with body and mind. It is going to clothes, it's going to home, it's going to family, it's going to friends, it's going to wealth. You slowly start thinking all that is you. The moment you think of yourself as something other than what you are, your thought will… can never stop. It will go on endlessly, awake or asleep, it'll go on. If you release yourself from that wrong identification of believing yourself to be something that you are not, it'll become still. Then when you want, you can think just like your hands. When you want, you can use it. When you don't want, you can keep it here. This is how all your faculties should be, isn't it? Hello? When you want, you can use it. When you don't want, you can keep it here. This is when a faculty is useful. If it runs all over the place, it is not useful. It is more of a nuisance. What is it that human beings are suffering? They're suffering their own intelligence. If you take away half their brains, they will all sit peacefully. 
Yes or no? They're trying to do that to themselves. Some people are soaking it in alcohol, some people are using some chemicals. So once their brains don't function, they feel peaceful and blissful. No, no, with full potential you must feel blissful. Disabled, you feel di blissful, what is the point of that? Yes or no? You disable yourself and pe feel peaceful or blissful, it's no meaning, it's just like rest in peace. When you're dead, everything is peaceful. Others are also peaceful, you're also peaceful. You're alive, fully on and you're blissful. This is important, isn't it? Because life is a bloody brief happening, don't ever forget that. You think it is long only because in some way you have made yourself miserable or made life process burdensome. See, on a given day, if you're very happy, that day, twenty-four hours, poof, went off like that, isn't it? Like a moment. Another day, you're a little frustrated, depressed. Twenty-four hours feels like a yawn. So only miserable people can have a long life. If you're really joyful, before you know what's happening, it'll be gone. It's so brief. For what potential a human being carries, if you live hundred years, it's nothing, it'll be gone before you know what happened. So, the thought process going the way it is, it's not about what I think about myself, what I think about you, it's not about that. It is compulsive thought process. Compulsively, it is happening. This compulsiveness cannot be countered with anything other than consciousness. You… if there is darkness in this room, if you… Mama, you must look at me, darkness, you know. If there is darkness in this hall, if I give you the task of kicking this darkness out, even if you are a big whatever, kung fu fighter, you can't kick it out, isn't it? You just switch on the light and it's gone. That's the only way you can deal with it. So this is the only way you can deal with compulsiveness only with consciousness. Consciousness means just this, that an intelligence beyond memory is alive within you. What did you have for lunch, Mom? You can tell me. Appam, oh, you come from Kerala. All right. Appam doesn't look like you. Appam doesn't smell like you. Appam doesn't taste like you. But you eat it and in a few hours' time it becomes you, isn't it? So there is an intelligence within this which can make them up them into a human being. What a transformation in four hours' time. Yes or no? Suppose I take a apam in my hand and make a human being out of it, who do you think I am? God himself, creator himself, isn't it? If I take a apam and make a human being out of it, you would think I am the creator. You are doing it every day, not in your hands, in your stomach, all right? But are you doing it or no? Hello? So this is the whole problem. There is an intelligence within you which is the very source of creation. You're completely missing it because you're too enamored with what you have gathered in terms of body, in terms of mental impressions, in terms of things and people you gathered. You're too identified with those things, so you're completely missing an intelligence which is the very source of creation. If you were in touch with that intelligence, there is no question, there will no be no question in your life. There shall be no question in your life because that is an intelligence which made everything happen. If you are in touch with that, everything is here. Parents today, and that's me myself, want to give away everything that we… what we have to our children, our thoughts, our attitude. But children don't want to take it at I'm glad <laughs> I am glad that you have reasonably intelligent children who are not taking up your thoughts and your attitudes <laughs> and and that creates a conflict at home so how do we how do we create a better you know harmony at home? see if you wanted that that <laughs> that your children should be just like you, then, uh, you know, that is possible if you were some other creature. 
that is not possible for a human being. Your children need not be, be like you at all. They must think, live and do something that you could not imagine. So when they do something that you cannot imagine, you will freak, all right? <laughs> you're freaking, not because they're going wrong, you're freaking because they're not like you. Because when they're not like you, they're not your property anymore. They never were your property. You must understand, you only give them a body, you can't create a life, that's not your making.